Recently, when I was reorganizing the workshop in a previous video, I had a sudden realization that the lay they have is far too big for my needs. It's not going to fit where I wanted to put it, and the capacity of the machine is much greater than I'm ever likely to need. So in this video, I'm gonna be taking a look at what's available to buy and downsizing to a smaller model. My old lathe has a capacity of 1100 millimeters between centers. I don't think I've ever turned anything longer than around 500 millimeters. And the overbed capacity is 370 millimeters in diameter. The biggest thing I've ever turned was our wedding cake stand, which was pretty close to that capacity actually, but going a bit smaller shouldn't be an issue. When I started looking online at the models that are available, as is often the case, I found a variety of different lathes, all from different brands, which all appear to be very similar models. They could all be made in the same factory, who knows, but I'm sure they are not all identical in terms of internal components and quality. But since I have no way of knowing how the quality differs between brands, I can only really go on the information available online. Unfortunately, I also have no way of physically looking at all these machines in person. Where I am in Norfolk, we have a serious lack of woodworking machinery suppliers, and the ones that are beyond Norfolk only tend to stock at best one or two of these machines at the most, and I'd need to travel many, many hours to go and see them. So I'm gonna stick with my tried and tested method of making a spreadsheet, color coding it based on my requirements, and then ordering the one that looks best for me. I've done a number of these videos in the past for various machines and they always seem to go down well, so let's get into it. The information about the capacity of the machines that I'm looking at between centers varies between 360 millimeters and 610 millimeters. That's a whopping 250 millimeter difference. I'm guessing some measure it with the centers fitted and maybe others don't, maybe in an attempt to exaggerate and mislead the buyer into thinking the capacity of the machine is larger than it really is, or perhaps some of the lathes genuinely do have longer beds than the others, who knows? But I'm just gonna have to take them with a pinch of salt and take a punt based on the information available. The length of the actual machines also vary between 870 millimeters and 1,078 millimeters, a difference of 208 millimeters. The diameter over bed capacities, however, only vary by five millimeters, the lowest being 300 and the highest being 305. Aside from capacity though, there are a few other things that I care about, which are in priority order. One, price. I don't turn often, probably about 10 times a year, so I don't need anything too fancy, and the cheaper the machine, the better as far as I'm concerned. Two, I want it to have a speed controller, as I don't want to be faffing about changing belts on motors all the time. And three, the spindle thread size, and that's because I already have a chuck, which was pretty expensive, so I want to carry on using it, and I'd rather not mess about with thread adapters if I can avoid it. There are other features that I'm interested in, like digital readout for speed, and some others which I'll cover later, but they are not deal breakers for me. These things I would just consider to be nice to haves. I'm not too worried about maximum or minimum speeds, or power, since all these lathes should be fine for what I need. So let's take a look at the spreadsheet, which is currently arranged in alphabetical order, and I can color code that based on my own requirements. Green is good, amber is okay, red is not good. Now, if I reorganize this and sort it in order of price, you'll see immediately that there are two standout models for me, which basically tick all the boxes for what I want in a lathe. And those models are the Lumberjack VSL305 and the Charnwood W824. Each of these machines have the spindle thread size compatible with my chuck, speed control, and the bonus is they both have digital readout too. And with a price difference of less than 15 pounds between the two models, both look like great options for me. The Charnwood W824 was actually my first choice as it has a couple of advantages. One, it has a round bar style hardened steel tool rest. I've not used one like that before, but I think I would prefer it over the usual type of tool rests available with most of these machines. I don't know, I just think maybe it would feel nicer to use. And two, it has an indexing feature on the headstock spindle with 24 indexing positions. Useful, for example, if you were making fluted legs or something fancy like that. Realistically though, am I ever going to use that feature? Probably not, but who knows, it might be useful one day. There was one problem with the Charnwood though, which is that it was out of stock everywhere. And some of the websites said that stock was expected in November, but bearing in mind that it was back in early August when I was reorganizing my workshop, I didn't particularly want to wait three months to see if that stock had appeared or not. The Lumberjack, however, was in stock and it looked to be a great option too. It also showed a working length of 455 millimeters in comparison to the 360 millimeters between centers on the Charnwood. 
and I was curious to find out if that capacity was true, so that's what I decided to go for, and now for the full disclosure part. I've had dealings with Lumberjack in the past, back when I reviewed their TS1800 table saw, and at the time they offered to send me any other tools that I might be interested in trying. And at that point in time, there was really nothing else I needed, but obviously there is now, so rather than buy one, I got in touch to see if they would like to send me one. And they did, so let's get it set up and have a look. Oh my God, it's tiny. It's pretty cute. In the box you get a manual, a live centre, a spur centre, a knockout bar, a spanner, some allen keys, a handle, and a tool holder for all of those bits which you can fit to the back of the lathe with a couple of machine screws. Right, so I'm dying to know what the capacity is between centres, so I'm going to move the tailstock back, insert the live centre and the spur centre, and then I can measure between, and we've got 440 mil, unless this tailstock goes back a little further, it does. That's 450 millimetres between centres, really happy with that. Let's see what the tool rest is like. I'll talk more about this later in the video, but the handles do tend to knock into each other, which is a bit annoying when in use. But all of the lathes I was looking at have this same problem, as they all appear to be identical. I also just want to check how concentric the live centre is with the spur centre. So I'll bring them together. Just going to bring the camera in close for you. So from the front, that's how good we are. And from the top looking down, I'll just put the manual here just so it's easier to see. But that meets up really nicely. That's actually way better than the Axminster lathe. This lever here locks the motor in place. And if I unlock it, I can adjust the position of the motor to tension the pulley. And in here should be the belt and the pulley so that I can see which wheel the belt is currently fitted to. And it's on the middle one, which is great. To be honest, I don't think I'll ever move it off that wheel. Right, I'm just gonna plug it in, turn it on and see how it sounds. Right, so on that middle belt setting, at the lowest speed, we've got 1,000 RPM. And on maximum speed, we've got 2,582. One of my favourite things about turning is that you can find a use for all the short bits and offcuts that tend to start cluttering up the workshop after a while. So I pulled out some bits and I'm going to attempt to turn three projects in the rest of this video to try out the new lathe so I can start to prepare some blanks and glue them up. The first project is going to be a spatula, using a thin piece of sapili for the centre and some pieces of beech. I'm going to get the faceplate removed and when I first used the knockout bar and spanner some of the chrome coating came off the bar. Not a big deal to me as it's still going to do the job, but it did make me wonder why bother adding the chrome coating if it's just going to chip away. I'll get my chuck added now so that I can secure the wide end of the workpiece and then I can set the live center. I use the roughing gouge to remove most of the excess material and then the spindle gouge to get a nice smooth finish. And finally the parting tool. I'm adding some of my handmade food safe oil wax finish. I still have some of this available on my Etsy store, there'll be a link in the description box, but I only have a few pots left and once it's gone, it's gone. I'll show the spatula in use later in the video, but now onto project two, some baby rattles. I drill holes where I can add some small screws, which will be the rattling bits and then laminate it together. I have enough length here to make two, so I can cut them apart before mounting them to the lathe. I know that I drilled the holes 50mm in from the end, so I can mark them up in an attempt to avoid cutting into where the holes are.
Oops. But I messed the first one up, unfortunately. So I started shaping the second baby rattle, this time leaving extra space to avoid the hull. But then I messed that one up too. I was going to take this out of the video, but I thought I should leave it in as everybody loves to watch a fail. The final project is going to be a bowl made up of some thick pieces of oak and maranti. And I glued a piece of sapili to the bottom too, and I can rough cut it to shape at the bandsaw. I'll use the face plate for truing it up and shaping the bottom of the bowl. And I'm using my bowl gouge this time. Even though I said earlier I'd probably leave the belt on the middle pulley all the time, I found the speed was a little bit too fast for turning the bowl, so I dropped the belt onto the smaller pulley, which was quick and easy to do. I don't know a lot about what speeds to use for what sized projects, I tend to just work with whatever feels right, and this felt much better to me. I cut a mortise in the bottom which I can use to secure the chuck to later, and then a final smoothing pass to try and remove all the tool marks. It looked pretty good, so I moved on to sanding and finishing, using some pure tongue oil, which is food safe. Then I can add the chuck so that I can flip it over to shape the inside of the bowl. I add more pure tongue oil, and then I left it for a couple of days to cure. And when I came back, I added some more of my food safe wax. If you're interested in buying this lathe or anything else from Lumberjack, including the TS1800 table saw that I reviewed previously, I now have a discount code. So if you use the code RAG AND BONE on their website, which I'll leave a link to in the description box below, you'll get 5% off and I'll earn a small commission too from any qualifying purchases. I've made a new lathe stand with some drawers underneath, taking my workshop drawer total to 47 I think. And this is on wheels just in case I ever need some additional space for infeed at the table saw. I'm pretty happy with the lathe. I think it's easily going to manage everything that I need it for. The one minor frustration is the tool rest handles and knobs, which knock into each other quite a lot when you're trying to reposition the tool rest. I understand why they've made the handles quite long because that extra leverage allows you to fix it down nice and tight and you don't want these things to slip but I'm sure this could be fixed by moving things around. But as I said earlier, all the lathes I was comparing seem to have the same design for the tool rest. The only other problem I encountered was the coating that chipped off the knockout bar, but I really don't care about that as long as the tool still works. If anyone watching has the Charnwood W824, hopefully you can comment below because I'm dying to know the distance between centers. Is it really the 360 millimeters as shown on the website? Because when you compare the images of the two machines, they look to me to be about the same size. So I can't understand how the Lumberjack can have an additional 95 millimeters. But other than that, this to me seems to be a good quality machine, especially when you consider the price. I think it's good value. Thank you for watching. 